Hey guys, it's Robert here with the Robert Gardner Wellness Podcast. I'm happy to have Chris Starfire with us on the program this evening. Uh, she is a subscriber and wanted to talk a little bit about regulation in addition to some of her dealings as a massage therapist. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, can you tell them a little bit of information about you and maybe how you got involved in massage and body work? Yeah, so uh, I've been doing massage next month, May, for 11 years now. And um, I started off because I woke up one day and decided I wanted to do a haircut. Um, so I went to school for cosmetology and then I went for makeup and massage was always in the back of my mind because I had always been good at it. Um, and I had gone to visit a school and just never did anything with it, but they would constantly send me emails being like, there's one seat left for this class that's coming up. There's two seats left for this class coming up. So I was like, all right, I'll bite. I'll go and take a look. And I noticed that if I just switched one of my hours at the salon that I was working at, that I could go. So I ended up going and um, I had always known massage to be more of like spa setting and relaxing and when I went and I saw that it could be more medical I was like that I want to do that cool so most of your practice has been more within that like medical vein it was um on and off um because I was still doing hair and makeup so I worked at chiropractors offices I worked at spas um but I always went back to pain management because um, yeah. that's always what I ended up specializing in um but even and I noticed still now that people are still like thinking even in a medical setting that it's going to be a fancy smancy, you're going to relax and it's going to be quiet and there's going to be candles and um, very spa like. And um, one of the chiropractors I worked for, I remember like, they would be like, oh, your insurance includes a little bit of massage. And they'd be like, oh, I'm getting a massage. And I would turn and I'd be like, it's not that kind of massage. Yeah. And bring them into the room and start my session. Yeah. It's always where we have to uh, do lots of education, depending on the kind of practice you're trying to sell to the public. Yes, definitely. So it's, and it's still a bit of a challenge. Um, I feel like, especially like where I live now, um, it's more geared towards you go and you get a massage and it's nice and relaxing and it's spa-like and people still do come for medical relief. Um, but I, I still think it's, it's still going to be a long haul before people do realize that there are many different ways that you can receive and get a massage. Yeah. Having uh, conversations about the word massage itself, not only have I gotten comfortable with what is Thai massage, I've gotten comfortable with what is massage. And in mm -hmm. my classes, I can teach therapists and then I just go, well, what is massage? And then they all start to like at each other and I go, my work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> it's like asking people, what is a knot? And everyone has yeah. a different word for it and like you see like especially like online there's just like a plethora of emojis that like come popping up on like everyone has a different wording for it and even when yeah. people come in because i don't use that word i hate that word um i feel like whoever made up that word should get bad handed because it's it's a made-up word and so <laughs> people will come in and they'll be like i have a knot and i'm like okay well when you say that what do you mean and they look at me and i'm like Ex explain this knot to me and then they're like they start and then they just go back to like, you know, a knot. And I'm like pointing at their shoes like that. That's a knot. That's how you make a knot. And I'm like, so tell me exactly what are you feeling? Is it tight? Is it restricted? Is it painful? Is it sharp? Like I need specifics. And then once I start telling them, give me something more specific than just, I feel something there. Then they're like, oh, okay, I got it. Yeah. I'm like, help me help you. Yeah. It's always been um, address their pain and then work on the explanation later. If I can help them with something and then explain this is why it helps or this is mostly what we think is going on according to research, that's been the sweet spot. But even though massage already existed as terminology when I started working 18 years ago, the industry is still fledgling. It's still trying to find its bearings and it's not really diversified that much. Most consumers still think massage is what they get when they go to massage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very much so. And I've never been to a massage envy. So when people tell me that that's all they've gotten, I'm like, all right, you're, you might be in for a surprise here. Well, <laughs> I mean, the funniest well, especially thing with to you. Me, yeah, the funniest thing to me is, and this is, I'm completely serious about this. You'll hear this again and again if you listen to my podcast or just dig through the vault. I don't have issues with clients. The clients love what I do. When what I do is I say, listen, 
Harold, are you having problems with pain? Look, well, come on in. I'm going to work on that. I, I think I can help address that. I work on him and he just completely freaks out. The clients love it and go, why isn't this available everywhere? And I go, because massage therapists tell me it's not massage. That puts me in a really weird position because I've never been around a mechanic who fixed a car in a way that other mechanics said, no, that's not fixing car. We don't know what you mm -hmm. just did. That like clothes on mat base makes me a complete pariah in the massage industry. I still don't understand why they don't consider it massage. Like what exactly are people saying that does not qualify it as massage because they're not naked, glued, nudity, glide, and the oil, that, how, how, so, table I don't want to go there, but I'm going to go there. If you take I don't want to go there, but I'm going to go there. Take away but the here's cream, the thing. take away the glide, take away the nudity, it's no longer massage to massage. The Says whom? How? There are so many different modalities out there. I don't understand how, like, it's just, it's just how they, they use it colloquially. I remember when I first heard that in one of your, um, I think it was probably one of your YouTube videos where they were saying that this isn't massage. I'm like, how is it not? Because I knew of Thai massage back when I was in school. Um, I had heard about it and I had heard about it through one of my teachers because he actually went to Thailand and married a Thai woman. Like his type were Thai women and she did Thai massage. And that was where I first learned about it. And he, he actually said, he's like, if you want to learn it, I would go to Thailand and learn from someone that actually knows Thai. Um, but what he said to me is, he said, everyone in Thailand learns Thai massage because the whole purpose of it is for the younger generation to do it to the older generation to keep them moving. So I was, and then when he brought her over here and she was doing Thai massage, he's like, we're having a little bit of a struggle because Number one, she's not a citizen yet, and she doesn't have a massage license. Yeah. So he's like, she can only do so much. It's inordinately complex, and uh, frankly, I just don't care. <laughs> other than other than marketing and building and branding to to increase business, like I, like literally, I could have traditional Thai teachers who say what you do is Thai. Okay, I could have other people say this is absolutely not Thai. Okay, I could have other people say this is manual therapy all right, like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm trying to build a better brand so I can go out and give it to whoever is wants it. So. And that's what it comes down to is, I mean, who cares what you do as long as you're helping, you're not hurting, you're not doing anything illegal, and you're bettering not only the client or the patient, but the profession as a whole. Yeah. And everyone just needs to mind their own damn business. <laughs> This is what it comes down to. Every time I hear this, I'm like, shut your mouth. Mind your own business. Stay in your lane. You do you. You don't have you know, to like it. I didn't know when we started that you're also a hairdresser. Um, and I use that term not in any negative way. Like, do you call yourself a hairstylist as opposed to a hairdresser? Is there like yes, I call myself a stylist. Everyone, everyone uses something different. I feel okay. like um, it's, it, I think it's a little bit generational. But yeah, um, yeah every, it's, it's whatever. So you have to have a license to cut hair. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and if you shampoo. You, well, and you will see what happens when people don't have a license once this <laughs> apocalypse is over. You just wait. <laughs> I have seen many Twitter posts just yeah. like, oh, this celebrity stylist is showing you how to cut your bangs. Do not cut your bangs. So my, my way of dealing with that, the branding issues is not through government regulation. It's from going direct to the consumer and educating them, particularly via video. Um, most of what I see, and this is highly debatable, I'm totally willing to go into this. Most massage therapists like massage regulation because they feel like it prevents competition. Partially. So I, I actually came from a state, I still hold my license in another state. Yeah. Um, and we had to jump through hoops in order what to state get- was that? Um, so I got my license in Illinois. So okay. I'm from Chicago originally, and I keep my license up in case I move somewhere where I do have to transfer it over or if the state that I move to, because my end goal is in a few months to be in LA if this apocalypse ever ends. Yeah. Um, and I know right now they don't regulate, but if ever they do, I don't want to have to go through that process all over again. So my fingerprints are in the FBI system. I had to go through the test. I remember actually in school, we were talking about, um, just getting our licenses and stuff. And I remember like my teacher was like, usually, you know, she's like, if you could do something wrong, you do your walk of shame because it's up on the site. 
And so we went on the site and she's like, usually people just let it lapse. She clicks on the first one and they got their license taken away for prostitution. She was like, okay. And so one of the kids in class goes, so when we're out looking for jobs, because where we went to school, one of the main roads had a lot of those places. So he's like, how do we know the difference between like a real massage place and like one of those? Uh -oh. And that teacher, <laughs> that that teacher handled it very well. She's actually a very good friend of mine now. And she actually said, she's like, well, I heard that the difference is that one of those places has like tinted windows where you can see out, but you can't see in, or they have like some sort of like blinds up in the front so that you can't see what's going on inside. And so we were like, oh, okay. So then we knew what to look for when we went out to look for jobs. So then we start going through everything that we have to go through in order to get our license, all of the fees that we have to pay, our transcripts, how many times we have to resend them out each time we have to send out with a fee. Then we had to pay for our license. Then we had to pay for the test. Then we had to pay for our fingerprints. And the same kid all of a sudden yells out, those tinted window places are looking mighty nice right about now. And like, we all just looked at him and bust out laughing. And we're like, why is it so much trouble to get our license? And she goes, I think it's because they figure that if you really want it, you're gonna go through all this in order to get it, where people that don't really want it or are going to do other stuff aren't gonna pay for it. Right now I live in a state where it's not regulated. And moving here, I had no idea, like I wasn't gonna come out here to do massage and someone else convinced me, they're like, no, you gotta, you gotta come out and do massage. And I was like, no, 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 no. And they had received massage for me. And they're like, no, you need to come out here and you need to do massage. And I was like, I don't want to pay to have my license transferred knowing I'm going to move to another state. They're like, I'll pay for it. Just come out here and do massage. And so I started looking it up and I couldn't figure it out. So the way that it goes here is that it's by city, but most places don't care. So Joe Schmo off the street, like the town that I live in right now mm -hmm. can make a home business and say that they do massage and bring in clientele and there's no regulation. And I've noticed that a lot of the people that come in to me, because right now I work at a clinic, um, and I hate I hate saying it because I don't want to badmouth anyone else, but people will tell me about their experiences at other places. And I was like, well, massage isn't regulated here. So I was like, I come from a place where I had to jump through hoops in order to get my license. So I was like, the massage you get from me is most likely going to be different. And they're like, oh, okay. And I feel like they're a little bit more open to allowing me to help them because they know that it's something legit. Yeah. I guess it's, it's really weird the way that they accept it. But once I say that, it's like the light bulb goes off like, oh, that must be why. Like there's no, there's like no continuing education out here. There's like, I can't find, I have to go to other states in order to get it. And you have to go online. <laughs> I, well, I do go online, but in, in person ones, I've gone to yeah. two different states so far to get it because there's, there's nothing here and I didn't understand it. And it's, it's very awkward to me to come from a place where it's so regulated to a place where well, it's just not. Um, I'm going to make assumptions. Um, and I don't know law in every uh, city and state. In Chicago, if you call it body work, you don't need a license. I don't know about that. I've taught there several times. It's, I mean, it's possible, but I don't, I don't know about that. Cause in, it, in Colorado, again, and I know you've said this, like yeah. there, you can go to the department of regulation, unless it's something big, unless yeah. it's something that's newsworthy, they're really not going to do anything about it. You can, you can go to Colorado and call it body work, Thai body work, no license necessary. That's so insane to me. Well, I mean, it's just like leftovers from um, Pennsylvania might have changed their rules. They used to have the Asian bodywork exclusion. So if it was Asian bodywork, you could do it without a license. Pennsylvania may have changed that. I'm not, I'm not sure. The states have slowly cracked down, but the reason they cracked down is because massage therapists get upset. Mas massage therapists get mad that mm -hmm. they paid 10 grand for school, and these people are coming in and practicing with no license whatsoever. Well, for me, it's yeah. more, I mean, yes, there's the competition aspect because, um, and I know that you brought it up in some of like your videos and things like that, but I actually have had people come in and they're like, I want my husband to come and get a massage from you after I've massaged them. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, that way he can come home and tell me how to do it. I was like, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. And I say that 
more from experience because I've had friends that I've massaged and then they're like, well, let me massage you. And I'm like, I can't even find an actual therapist with a license that I like. How, why do like, I don't want to put you in there. Like, no, no, let, let me, let me just try. And they do things that I do, but it's not, it's not proper. And I'm like, I'm like stop that. What are you doing? And they're like, this is what you do. I'm like, not like that. <laughs> so that's what I think of when they're like, oh yeah, then they can come home and tell me how to, I'm like, no, 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 that's not how this works. It, I mean, it's complex. In the end, I always go back to this. Generally, I'm against regulation, but I get a lot of hate mail because of that stance. And what it amounts to is I'm licensed. I have three licenses in Texas alone. I'm a massage therapist. I'm a massage instructor and I'm a CE provider. In addition to that, I'm nationally certified. I get my classes approved as national certification approved classes with a number. And then some states don't accept that. So it's like when I go to various states, each state has different rules. It's like I have to jump 50 sets of rules to be able to educate people. Or you can subscribe to my subscription service absolutely free for your first month and it scales globally. I don't know what the rules are in Lithuania, but somebody subscribed from there the other day. And see, I think yeah. that the reason why you get so much hate mail is because you put yourself out there. Because there yes. are other companies that also provide, they do provide CE hours, but they also provide services to people that aren't licensed. I actually saw one of the companies that someone said, I feel like I have to have some sort of like physician's degree in order to take one of your classes. And the company responded and they're like, oh no, you can just come and take our class. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And it, I immediately thought of you because I know that you get a lot of hate mail for that. And there wasn't one person that was like, oh, that's not fair, this, that, the other, like nothing. But I think it's because you're out there that you're an easy target. Sure. I mean, I've, I've gotten used to it. Like, people are like, well, I hate you. I disagree with you. And I'm like, okay. I hate uh, you. Well, I love you and I disagree with you. Like, so what? We have a difference of opinion. Like, we can have a debate. Like, it doesn't mean I dislike you as a person. Um, the other thing is, you know, again, the strangest thing is me being an educator in the massage industry and being consistently told class after class after class by massage therapists that the way I manipulate soft tissue is not massage. They do not recognize what I'm teaching as belonging to them. And when I go, well, listen, if it's not massage, I'm gonna go teach it globally to the yoga community. They're like, oh, but they don't have licenses. And I'm like, you just told me it wasn't massage. So what are they saying that it is? They have no idea because they've never seen it before. Get rid of the table, get rid of the cream, get rid of the glide, get rid of the nudity. When you get rid of those four things, you have a mat-based form of basically what's therapeutic Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'm teaching a mat-based discipline using my legs and feet in addition to my hands and arms on a mat clothed. Massage therapists go, this is not massage. I've never seen this. And I'm like, I know because it doesn't exist except in my studio. Like it's very rare. There are occasionally places that are uh, time massage related facilities, maybe a little bit of shiatsu floating around. But even the subscribers in the Reboot Insiders Club, I tell them, listen, less than 1% of the marketplace is mat-based. And I teach less than 1% of that 1%. I just think it's so weird because it's not, I don't want to say that you're not like special or that what you're teaching isn't unique or anything, but it is stuff that I've seen before. So when I found you, I was like, I was like, all right, I'm going to like, I randomly found you. I don't even know what I was looking up. And I was like, oh, what's this guy doing? Yeah. And I was like, oh, he's doing time massage. And I was so excited because I think the only other person that I had ever heard anything about Thai massage from was from my instructor that married a Thai woman who did Thai massage. Um, and I remember being like, well, I, I want to learn from, if I'm supposed to learn from someone that's from Thailand, then I want to go to Thailand. But I was like, to take the time off to go out there and do all that. And then seeing what you did, I was like, that's, I was like, I've seen this before and I've wanted to incorporate this. So let me see what else he's got. So that's why I don't like, I, I don't know if it's necessarily that, um, I don't want to say that therapists are being closed minded, but are, like, are they only stuck on like, all right, this is what I know. This is what they've said in school that we should take for CDs. Yes. That's what I'm going to look for yes. because you, you, 
I mean, if you truly want to help, I mean, knowledge is power. It really is. So learn it, learn it all. Learn every, like I learn everything that I possibly can. And maybe jack of all trains, master of none, but I can pull from different tools that I have in my box and help. Like, isn't that the point is to help people? Like, is that not yes. why we're in this? I mean, to help people and to make money, but I mean, I genuinely wanted to help people. The problem is you take a student, they've been trained in school in a certain way of thinking, and they say, they've, let's use a language example. They've studied English. And I come in and go, no, 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 let's do Arabic. It's a different script and you write from right to left now. And they go, oh my God, what is this? That's the same sort of thing. It's like, it doesn't get rid of anatomy, physiology, health and hygiene, uh, certain components of like manual therapy and how you in interact with tissue, but you're teaching it in a mat based format, close on that nobody's ever seen or the large majority of the population has never seen. And that's, I mean, it's, I can see taking away the table. I can see taking away the oil, but it's like, some of the stuff that you do, we actually learned in my school um, when we did chair massage. Yep. And that was some of the things that you were doing. I was like, I was like, oh, we did that. Oh, we did that. Oh, well, oh we did we did that. To give you an idea, there was a, a school semi-local to me. Um, they contacted me and said, hey, we want you to come in and teach. And I said, okay, well, what do you do for rental, you know, for CE classes? And they're like, oh, no, not CE. We actually want you to come into core curriculum and just teach a little bit of this. And I was like, what? And I went in and taught, and I think I did like a day or two, just two days, a day or two. And what happened was after I left, the students go right back because they were totally blown away with what I was showing them. They kept trying to do what I was showing them, and their teacher yelled at them and said, stop doing that. We're doing Swedish because I throw a monkey wrench in the system. Does it make sense? And I, I know I've seen you talk about this in, the, in other videos and I, was, I remember looking and I was like, so when they sought you out, what did they think you were gonna do? Cause obviously uh, they wear, found wear, you. Wear a suit, be professional, curse less, <laughs> and certainly not speak truth. <laughs> But like, I mean, they had to have known that whatever you were going to teach the kids were going to implement. I mean, isn't that the point? You bring in a teacher so that they can implement I, whatever I think you in, taught. In that specific case, I think there was a little bit of envy. I think that the owner actually got angry that the kids liked me and what I was teaching so much, you know, being different. But to me, it was kind of like he was dad and I was the cool uncle. I was like, have a beer. <laughs> You know, dad's a stodgy one. He's like, follow the rules, stop it. <laughs> I'll have you sneak like, out tonight. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, just have a beer. It's this party. <laughs> it's just a slightly different um, perspective. You know, when it comes to teaching, I can say this. I've, I've done enough research with my lawyer's help to understand um, people from the yoga community or anybody who wants to study. I've been teaching intro and table tie for years and years. Um, couples, occasionally a husband and wife would come in and take intro tie with me. And I would just help them with a little bit of additional information related to anatomy, but occasionally massage therapists would kind of, oh, you know, we don't like that you're teaching people who aren't licensed. And I'm like, there are a husband and wife who want to work on each other. And I have every vested interest in getting money from them and teaching them. Like, and there are other places that do the same on a table, nude and with oils and so why is it because you're doing it out in public or like what like is it because you're charging how more and you feel I, like oh well how, now I'm not going to get that money how dare how I how dare I do my job public how I how dare I take out a camera and record what I do what is this asshole <laughs> what does he think he is <laughs> well I mean I got tired of apologizing for being me I just go out and go listen I follow the laws but I break all the rules and the rules are just these made up, you know, contrite notions people have in their minds about what we do and how they think it is. And I just don't subscribe to that. Um, to survive and for me to get over chronic pain to make sure I didn't start shooting heroin, I had to develop what I do and I had to combine elements of Thai massage and yoga into something that helped me transform my body to the point I'm not in chronic pain all the time. 
I'm just using those techniques that I've borrowed from other cultures in various ways, mixed and matched and blended, but I'm teaching an American marketplace how to use them, how to package it, and how to sell it. Which should be embraced. Everything else is embraced. Why is this one not? Or why is it, maybe it's just you. No, I'm, I'm not, because he's an asshole. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's giving us the beer. Because, well, being a, being a white guy doesn't help. I mean, flat out. I think that that, I honestly, I think that that probably has to do with the majority of it. I think that if you were someone that came from Thailand and was doing exactly what you're doing, yeah. it would be a whole other story. But it doesn't bother me. It's like I've, I've dealt with it for so long now, I just don't, I don't get concerned. Like, it's kind of like time massage and saying Christian. Well, I'm like, okay, well, Episcopalian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Baptists, you know, like, that's a really broad brush. It's like saying Muslim, okay, Muslim fundamentalist, like Sunni, Shia, like, you know, like, there's complexity there. So I just don't spend a lot of time focusing on it. I always go, how can I help more people? Let's go do that. And then I go, podcast, video, subscription service, push it out, push it out, push it out. And they're like, oh, this guy won't shut up. <laughs> Basically, I mean, that's, that's why I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, but it works. The thing is, you don't need, I feel like Kanye West sometimes. Um, Kanye, I, I haven't listened to a lot of his music, but Kanye is very polarizing as a character. Um, people, some people love him, some people hate him. There's not a whole lot in between. And I think that I am sort of like that, but I just keep drawing the people who love it, more subscribers, more students, more clients, and keep building. And this just goes smaller. Like, I can't hear this over the roaring fans. Well, I don't think that you would be as, as successful as you are if you were paying attention to that. I think that that's what holds a lot of people back is that they're too busy listening to the little nagging instead of listening to the, yes, you can, you can do this, keep going. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're creating something new in the West. I mean, we understand that time massage exists. We know a little bit about it. But in the mass marketplace, there is no time massage envy. This is not, you know, like I said, I... I Let's I hope that there's not ever. Oh, what? But that's my goal. No, it's not. I'm starting the chapter of time massage envy. All I just right. have to get massage envy to take me on as corporate sponsorship so I can push them into a mat-based discipline. <sighs> okay. Okay. So why would I do that? You know what? I actually, honestly, I don't, I don't doubt that you would be able to do that because I do know that they are implementing um, a class Great, so. that I just took and they, no, 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 not that. It's something else. I'm not going to say what it is, but um, I went to another class and love the class and all of a sudden he comes up with, yeah, they're giving this to every massage envy. And I looked at him and I said, what did you just say? And he said, um, I was like, you mean like they're going to do what you're showing me, not like all this advanced stuff? And he goes, no, they're going to show them, you know, their basic stuff in the curriculum, and then they're going to be encouraged to come and take advanced classes so that they know more. And I'm like, okay, so you guys are going to give them a half-assed education on this, and then people are going to be turned off by it because they're not going to be properly doing it. Well, I mean, most people would say giving a half-assed education is what I'm doing online. I mean, I guess, but that you can get any other modality online as well through webinars and also get CE credits, even through like AMTA, AMBP, yeah. you can. I mean, listen, if the cost of success is haters, bring them on. <laughs> bring the pitchforks, bring the fire. Bring Dude, I'm going to say that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Like he was, I mean, he was hated for a long time and he's like, he's like, you, all you guys are doing is talking about me. What does that do? It makes more people want to listen to me because it's like, well, what's the, what's this guy doing? Why does everyone hate him? I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. And in the end, I just, I said this about the traditional time massage community long-term what the traditional time massage community will have to do is they will have to somehow figure out why they hate me so much for easing suffering. But I think it does have to do with jealousy. Because I mean, honestly, what else could it be? Like it can't, because you're not straying. I feel like, like when I hear about like people like hating you and like everyone's like coming at you for, I feel like they are talking as if you have taken the phrase time massage 
and you were like, I'm just gonna splash some cherry Pepsi on you, and then I'm gonna kick you a few times, and you're on your way. Like you have created something completely different as if it's nowhere near the scope of time massage. When this is number one, what time massage is fundamentally in, like it's part of like the foundation because you're trying to help people to continue to live a better life. Yeah. And it, like I said, like when I saw the pictures of my teacher's wife, um, like they had done like promotional pictures and they had them on the website, it was the stuff that you show. Yeah. So you're not, it's not like you've taken this phrase and are doing something completely off the wall with it. No, I mean, I, the thing is, it, to me, it's a little bit like mixed martial arts. Did Bruce Lee, who was the progenitor of kind of a mixed martial arts, Bruce Lee developed Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do was a mixture of Wing Chun, the footwork from fencing, and some grappling. So he kind of hybridized and created a new form. What people are saying is, Robert, you're, you're a white guy, you can't do that. And I go, okay. And I just keep doing what I've been doing the whole time. I'm like, listen, I can help people in pain. You could call it whatever you need to call it. I'm going to brand it, sell it, move on. Like I can get hate mail, but I guarantee you right now, if you flew me to Thailand and I hung out and I worked with Pichette, Pichette would likely look at my work and go, ah, good, good. Just because you're delivering work and helping people with pain. And that's what he does. The problem is in the American marketplace is the branding, packaging. It's the same reason why the therapist if the yoga teacher takes a class are like, ah, because they think that this brand belongs to this community. And I'm like, no, the massage community is the one that keeps telling me it's not massage because it doesn't resemble the service that they've been taught to deliver. I've taught in local facilities here in Austin and I'm not lying to you. You know, the guy says, man, listen, the class was awesome. This is one of the apprentices I work with. He said, the class was awesome, and but he's like, it's causing problems. And I go, okay, hold on. The class was great, but it's causing problems. So what's the problem? And it's like, he starts kind of rambling about it. And I'm like, okay, you tell me, is what I teach easy to use and beneficial to the therapist and their body mechanics? Absolutely. Is it effective for chronic pain? It helps people very quickly. Absolutely. And you and the owner are going to make more money because people are pleased with the services there. And he said, yes. I'm like, okay, if the owner doesn't want something that's effective, easy to use, and good for the clients and his business, I don't have anything to sell him. So what's the problem? He's like, well, it's not what they teach. And I go, so I have no answer. That's why you're there. Why, why else would you be there if you're going to teach no, something that because they already know? No, I am to submit. I am to kowtow to the authorities, to the leaders, the regulators, the school owners, and I'm supposed to just take it. You're not supposed to stand up and be proud of what you've done, what you've created. That's like running contrary to what they're teaching. What I do is an, an, an edge. Like basically I got pushed onto the internet. That's why I do what I do now because you know, local massage therapists aren't keeping me so busy teaching classes that I can't be awesome. They're, they're actively pushing away what I'm doing because it's too weird, it's too different, it's mat based it's this, it's that. And for the most part, even schools here in Texas, they're slowly taking away any mat based portion out of the curriculum. Do you think it's because they're actually afraid of it or do you think it's because they have such trouble marketing it? that it's like, well, now this scares me because even though I may like it, so if I can't sell it, it makes no use to me. Most of the therapists who go to local schools, and this is Texas, every state's gonna be a little bit different. You're in Minnesota, you were in Chicago, you know, Illinois and Minnesota, different rules, different situations. Most of the schools are teaching to get therapists to go work at places like Massage Envy. They're not training them to work in private practice. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what starts to happen is the curriculum sort of gets watered down from these mom and pop schools to produce a bevy of therapists that are inter, inter, interchangeable cogs in a machine so they can fire one and hire another. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think that a lot of places do get kicked back from massage envy. We actually had a place in Chicago that um, they were, I don't exactly know, but they were in cahoots somehow with massage envy and ended up closing down because um, right. they they weren't having enough enrollment and like the kids weren't going, like they weren't going to massage envies. And so they weren't getting that kickback. So yeah. they ended up losing a lot of money. But I think that a big problem with schools is that they're also, you know, they're teaching them 
they talk a little bit about, yeah, you could go on your own. I mean, all the instructors that I had, they all worked for themselves. Um, so they talk a little bit about it, but they don't actually show you how to get out there and do it on your own. Yes, work under someone else when you first get out. Figure out what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. Figure out how you want to run your business, how you don't want to run your business. And some people, I think that that's, that's just where they're going to be, is always working underneath someone because having your own business is hard. It's a lot of work yeah. and you, you, tax time comes around and you're like, where is this receipt? I know I had it. And you're trying to get everything in order. Tax time is the worst. And I have a friend that is in another state and he has a guitar shop and he's like whipping out all these receipts and he's like sending me text pictures of the episode. I was like, why don't you get like the folder with the like months in it? And then each month you just put your receipt. He's like, that's brilliant. He's like, but I work for myself and I know that one day it's going to happen in my lifetime. I'm going to get audited. He's like, and I want to make sure that that auditor has to stay here as long as possible while I search through each and every receipt. I was like, are you serious right now? I was like, how about you just get all the receipts before the auditor gets there, but for tax time so that you're not doing this, yeah. you have it all there. But I feel like, I, I think that business management should be required in, you know, cosmetology schools, massage schools, um, even makeup schools, because they don't teach you how to work for yourself. They don't tell you the difference between being an employer and being an independent contractor. So then you come out of school and you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to go be an independent contractor and you're really an employee and then you're just getting fucked. But most people don't know that. Most of the stuff that the therapist needed, what I realized was I had a, a, a phrase where I was kind of frustrated because schools weren't teaching what the therapist needed. And then I went, well, that's what you do, man. Like, don't be irritated that the schools don't teach it. Just go provide it. And now I provide it for free for the first month and $7 a month thereafter. And I keep just adding content. Um, the whole thing was I felt like I got pushed onto the internet. And as an anarchist, Oh, I really thrive on the internet with no rules, no boss, nobody telling me what to do and when to do it. <laughs> it's like, here, <laughs> let, me, let me show you how to do this. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to the industry long term. I think that my speculation has been, we talked about massage envy, you know, that standard table cream glide nudity session is a little bit more of a fixture in American life. What I think is going to happen is we're going to have differentiation in the marketplace. So there's not just McDonald's now. There's Whataburger. There's In-N-Out. There's Wendy's. There's Burger King. There's different spas and facilities taking a slightly different take on that hamburger frying a drink. A slightly different take on the massage and how it's packaged and delivered. What I keep doing is trying to get independent therapists like you, if they want to, to focus on mat-based work, clothes on and basically decimate like an entire subsection of the industry if that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. You kind of reminded me of Elton Brown when you were like, there's not this, so I'm going to do this. Cause I had originally heard that that was his story. I don't know if yeah. you guys know who Elton Brown is. He's, um, a, yep, he's a cook, yeah. he's on Food well, Network. Well, um, yeah. He has good eats. Well, I guess the reason that he had started what I heard was that he was sitting there watching a show on must have been Food Network or some cooking show. And he's like, I hate how they always just show you how to do it, but they don't tell you why. Yeah. And his wife was like, all right, well, then why don't you go do it? And now he's like all over the place. So yeah. that's what you reminded me of when you said that. Well, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, so I went into school for massage. If I hadn't gone into school for massage, I would have been a cook. Not only am I familiar with Good Eats and Alton Brown, I've read Harold McGee's on food and cooking cover to cover. That is the tome of basically culinary like um, chemistry, food chemistry. So the whole thing is Alton Brown to me was like this combination of Bill Nye the science guy and a chef. Yes. And he actually showed you like, well, this is a Maillard reaction. This is why these compounds brown a certain way and produce these different chemical compounds. But because you understood the chemistry at a basic level, you could manipulate it to change mm -hmm. food to induce different flavors, um, textures. So it's that sort of thing. Oh, what does that me. sound like? What does what sound like? You, you could take the basic chemistry of it and then change it and mold it to what you needed. Yeah. Oh, kind of like your time massage, huh? It's just what I do. Everybody thinks it's the deepest compressions imaginable. And I'm like- But oh. what is it that you say in every one of your videos? Every single one of your videos, there is always one duckling that is just 
off on its own and you're always like that is the perfect student because you took what i showed you and you changed it around so that you could do it better for you yeah the 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 one flaw and this is really challenging as a teacher um my body is not yours your mobility your strength your flexibility is, is different than mine what I'm always going to do is I'm going to teach from the way that I would do it. And then I watch students and I can see them struggling and I'm like, oh, um, oh, wow, they must have like really tight hips. And then like I show them a different way and they go, whoa, there's like more than one way. And I go, <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's lots of ways. But what I have to do as an educator is I have to help you find your practice. That's why even in the subscription group, I'm very you know, steadfast about the math-based practice. I'm still teaching on a table. I'm still teaching table work because the therapists need it. I have to give them enough table work to create this slide where they get a chance to decide, well, maybe I'll do a little math work, but no, I, I like the table. And I don't really make a judgment on them about that. It's like, I'm just trying to really amplify the number of tools they have. So that again, if we use Alton Brown as the example, they can manipulate the chemistry to create what they want. Which is perfect, which is, I think, part of the reason why, I know at least for me, it was part of the reason why I was drawn to you and the way that you work because it was something, it was something different out of my toolbox that could help people. And I'm always looking for, all right, how else can I approach this? Because I feel like one thing, one modality, one step, one hand gesture, whatever it is, isn't going to be the same thing for everyone else. Just because it works on this person doesn't necessarily mean it'll work on someone else. Yeah. So a sequence, and this will happen repeatedly. Um, I teach sequences, the workbooks, DVDs, time massage, sequences. And then after I did those kind of core sequences, we broke it down like this is the sequence for carpal tunnel. You know, this is the sequence for upper back and neck pain. And I'm going to continue doing that. But in the end, I don't really teach sequences. The problem is what happens when I apply the sequence to you and it doesn't work? Mm hmm and that's where people um, will critique because I talk in my videos when I'm teaching. They're like, oh, you know, Robert talks a lot. And it's like, well, I know that these are being recorded so that students are going to be watching these trying to learn. You know, when I'm actually just giving you a session and I'm not recording it, I'm usually quiet, you know, more at least. Mm -hmm. But what I have to do is I have to, in session, I have to actually communicate with you, Chris and communicate about what you're feeling and communicate about what that problem is to try to facilitate that connection with you to help you with that specifically. I don't care what tools I use so long as I can work with you in a way that's going to help you. And half of it is like how you feel about me as the therapist. So yes. techniques. it's not, Oh, I use an elbow. I use a knee. No, it's like, how does she feel about the connection and relationship we form during the session? Oh, definitely. And it's, it's really funny because, um, like the place that I work at now, like I obviously have RBF all the time, no matter what. And RBF? the resting bitch face. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, actually the acupuncturist I work with because the way that our clinic is, it's two storefronts and one side of the clinic is mainly chiropractic. And then our side is massage and acupuncture. And the acupuncturist has now had three different people tell her that I am scary. And she goes, I promise you, she just looks scary. She's like, just try her. She will help you. Um, and it's, I always tell people that I tend to bring a certain type of person to me. I can see people walking out of the parking lot. I already know what you're going to come and tell me you have problems with. You don't even have to open your mouth. Obviously, I have you open your mouth because I want to make sure. But um, I always have the really, the people that are in that much pain that they're just so angry yeah. because they're so frustrated. And yeah. so I actually told one of the patients, I was like, I tend to bring a certain type of person to me. And I was like, I actually saw you walking in the parking lot. I was like, I already knew what your problem was. And afterwards, she's like, I felt 99% better. And she goes, before she left, she goes, I promise you I'll be in a better mood next time. I come here. I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, do not apologize. I was like, you're in pain. I was like, yeah. that's, that's what's going to happen. You're in pain. You're frustrated. I was like, you have every right to be angry, especially when you've gone other places, especially when you've gone to your medical doctor for two months, they misdiagnosed you. I was like, I'd be angry. Yeah. Why wouldn't you be?
But I, and I also had someone that was also angry and snippy and he was like, I, that's just not me. And I knew that because I had actually massaged both of his sons and they were like, cool as cucumbers, just let it flow, everything's fine. And so meeting their dad, I could sense that that just wasn't him. But during the massage, I was like, I was like, so normally I was like, you know, I see that you marked on your thing that you don't mind a lot of talking, but I was like, because you are in pain, I was like, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more just so that we can make sure that we get at whatever your problem is. He goes, okay. And so we're talking and, you know, I'm getting at a few good sore spots and I was like, you're going to have to trust this process. And he's like, if you can't trust your massage therapist, who can you trust? I was like, I am making a shirt off of that. <laughs> he's like, can I get some royalties? I was like, sure. I mean, the practice itself is amazingly diverse, even if we call it massage. But as insiders, we have a different view of what we do every day. And the mass market, because I deal with social media and putting stuff out, the mass market, the most famous massage therapist in the United States is Phoebe from Friends. Uh, yes. Yeah. There's yeah, the, there's or, the, or that chick that Jerry Seinfeld dated that would not give him a massage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the, the, that's the two that come up all the time just because of mass media saturation. Mm -hmm. There's been no, to my knowledge, there's been no crossover massage therapist who hung out with Oprah, who hung out with Dr. Oz, who hung out with Dr. Phil, and educated the public about what massage is. Yeah. Well, and then you have, you know, other therapists that are out there that are massaging celebrities and not putting therapists in the best light. And it's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't do any of that. Just I'm like, it's going to be good. It's not going to be what you think it is. And, you know, people always ask me, have you heard of this person? Have you heard of that person? I'm like, yes, I have. This is not what that's going to be like. Hmm. Or they see things like Phoebe on Friends and they're like, is this going to be? I'm like, no, it's not. I was like, first of all, I haven't seen Friends. I don't need to. Whatever you're thinking in your head, that's not, that's not this. Yeah. And trying to say, you know, this is what it is. It's not this. There's a branding issue. I'm attempting to solve the branding issue on my own by rebranding and saying, okay, everybody seems to have a failure to understand what I do. So I'm going to tell you what I do and form a brand and logo and, you know, just keep pushing forward, keep going. What I think is interesting is, you know, as an educator, you just have to be a couple steps ahead of the students is generally what I think happens. And then as I keep going, like I just added today to the vault, a little bit more yoga stuff because I'm trying to walk the massage community towards yoga and they start to go, oh, but I, I do massage, you know? And then the yoga community, I'm trying to walk towards, <laughs> it's like, because I'm pulling from both simultaneously. So it, it starts to break it down after a while. To me, intellectually, semantically, and in jargon and language, you know, in the end, I can show people how to help people and I can show people how to help people legally whether or not they can practice in a certain state is just completely up to that state and their laws, depending on the interpretation. And it's so weird that like, you feel like you have to like bring one community along with the other community and try and bring it together. Because one thing that I've never heard you so far call this, and it's something that when I was looking up time massage to see if there was anyone in my area that provided it, just so that I could see, um, they all called it the lazy man's yoga. And yeah. I, I, I don't do yoga. It's way too slow for me. I have tried so many times. I went to a class and I was, I, I just, I couldn't. And I remember looking and I was like, I don't want to do yoga. And then I saw that you were a yoga instructor and I was like, mm. but the more videos that I watched. So why did you I mean, have a response when you found out I was a yoga teacher? Because I thought that there was going to be more yoga like, and I was like, oh, I don't okay. like yeah. yoga. And, um, and then, you know, like I said, I kept seeing that it was called like the lazy man's yoga. And I was like, I don't, but then I kept watching your videos and I was like, I don't, I mean, I guess I could see where people call it yoga, but yeah. I didn't, I guess because I saw it more as a modality or as body work and as helping people, it didn't, it didn't click into me as that. I, I think in indigenous cultures, I, I kind of look at it this way, because I fell into time massage. I'll never escape time massage. 20 years from now, even if I rebrand successfully, I'll still be talking about time massage. Uh, yoga is the same thing. Yoga and time massage, you know, yoga in India, time massage in Thailand, 
these to me are kind of like backwoods, third world physical therapy. But the yoga is the one that you do to yourself. This is more like a yingar, like props and stuff. Thai massage is more like somebody does it to you. What I was doing as a Westerner was hybridizing and going, ooh, wow, there's like all this creative back and forth between joint mobilization, pressure, feedback into the nervous system, you know, kind of blending that stuff. The problem is if I take the massage therapist, the subscribers right now, and I take out foam rollers and I show them how to use the foam roller as a massage tool, but now we're gonna do hands-on assists and soft tissue work while the person's in the foam roller, the massage therapist start to back away and go, I don't understand, this looks like yoga. Because there's this, in, there's this divide for them between these two disciplines that I'm like, no, there's one species, one. This works for the same damn reason it works on everybody on earth because we have a nervous system. And that's what I keep skewering. I mean, even further than that, you know, in yoga, the yoga community is adapted and evolved. The Thai massage community mostly is, is fighting this, you know, provincial battle about tradition. And I kept saying, wait, 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 wait. The Buddha didn't have antibiotics traditionally. They didn't have vaccines for polio traditionally. I think science is good. And I think you can infuse Buddhism with science if you need to, to understand what happens when people meditate. To say that we're going to change a tradition is where you get into like some weird, you know, things. And I just go, okay, I don't do time massage. I'm moving on with life because I don't have time to fight this till the time I'm dead. I just keep refining it. I keep teaching it. I keep packaging it. Again, I have no issues with clients. It's the communities, the massage community in particular. The yoga community for the most part has not picked up what I do because it just doesn't fit within the context of what they're used to delivering and serving in the American marketplace. And I think um, going back to what you said about like therapists being afraid of this and what you would do. Um, I know you had said it in actually probably one of the first videos that I saw of you that people were comparing it to what Eric Dalton does. And I went and trained with him in Costa Rica and it is, there, there are a lot of similarities. There are some that are not, but there was a student in the class and he worked underneath one of Eric Dalton's um, like assistants. And the end goal was for the student to take over that business. So, and I overheard him talking to his roommate as they were getting, we were getting ready to set up for the class. And he goes, yeah, he's like, you know, I read all the books and I, you know, took the classes and stuff. And he's like, I dabbled in it here or there. But he's like, I didn't start getting referrals until I stopped being afraid of this. Yeah. So, and I feel like this is similar. Like if people can just stop being afraid of this, mm -hmm. everyone will be good. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. If this isn't for you, it's not for you. It's not going to be for everyone. Change. People are horribly averse to change. Um, they like the idea of thinking they're progressive and they change. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. E even Facebook. Facebook slowly changes things. Because if they change too many things all at once, people get angry. <laughs> they have to make... Facebook also changes things because once, once they start slowing down and they're not all up on SEO, they yeah. do it purposely because they know that when they change things, you have to go on there and figure it out for X amount of hours. So since more people are active on it, it actually raises them up in Google search. Interesting. It's like a blog. You know how like the more that you blog, the more, I mean, you're already up there, but for the rest of us people, the more that we blog, the higher that we are on the search engine because it shows that there's activity and newer yeah. content will show up first. Yep. That's why all the social medias are always up on top because there are always people that are on it and using it. So it looks like there's always fresh content. I mean, there is always fresh content, but it's constantly going. I just try to adapt. I mean, I'm, I'm the first person that's like, oh, they changed something again. Like I got so much right I'm on every platform. Why do they keep changing TikTok's interface or whatever they do? But at the same time, I think just representing change in an industry that is not familiar with it, you know, I feel again like a pariah. Teaching a map based close on discipline is a stark uh, change. 
Now, I've got to get like 100 students to do it successfully and film and photo document the whole thing and it's game over. But it's gonna take time. You know, it, it'll only be later that people might look back and, you know, sort of laud me for what I did. While the whole time you were doing it, people just bitched. <laughs> Right. Do you actually know what, um, I don't want to say the turnover rate, but like as far as like, you know, the classes that you've done, do you know how many students actually go on to continue to actually use your work? So um, I would have to make guesses. Over the years that I've been teaching, which has probably been about 10, I would say most of the students pick up a move or two that they incorporate into their table work. I would say one out of maybe a hundred students added a little bit of map based work to their practice and only about one out of a thousand did it successfully and started building a map based practice. Okay. Yeah. Just, and those are just general numbers, me just making things up on, on the fly. Um, the challenge is, and understand it too, when we talk about regulation and all that, massage therapists can come in, they can love what I do, and they understand when they're in class with me for that three-day intro time, they understand he is teaching something that I cannot go get a job doing. Because Unless facilities work for themselves. Exactly. And that is a huge impediment because the therapist in class will look at me and say, when are you going to open a place? And I'm like, why do you want me to open a place? And they're like, well, because I want you to give me a job. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I want you to go work for yourself. And they're like, oh, I just wish you'd do it for me. <laughs> and, it's, and then you have to wonder, like, do they want you to do it for them because they're hoping that, like, clientele will already come in so they don't yes. have to build that on their own? Yes. Or is it the whole business aspect? Yes. Or is it Absolutely. all of it? It's, so the thing is, I can, I can teach them technique. The technique is not that challenging. I can teach technique, what I can't teach, or what they're unwilling to learn, I should say, is the business. Because they're like, oh, I want to help people and be a hippie and like work on people and burn incense and smoke weed. Like, why do I got to build a business? I don't want to do taxes. I don't want to do But again, a lot weed. of it's not taught, so you're going to be afraid of what you don't know. Well, I, I teach for seven bucks a month. <laughs> and it keeps, it keeps. And, but I don't, the, that's the thing is that I don't think a lot of people know that that's on your subscription service. So the challenge that we've had is the subscription service right now has about 500 hours of content. Um, I uploaded more today, which was well over an hour more footage. And like we keep doing that every week. What I keep doing is in addition to this footage growing in the vault, we do a specific CE class on carpal tunnel, a specific CE class on upper back mm -hmm. and neck pain. And I'm working on a class now that's for social media marketing and self-care. I saw it. I was like, when are you going to pull that out? Well, we're working on it because mostly what I'm doing to develop the, the social media marketing class is I'm talking with people like you and um, screen sharing using Zoom and then like showing you the insides of Instagram, hashtags, how do you post, you know, you got the main feed, like just a basic tutorial on how to use mm -hmm. that social media platform as a therapist. In the end, I don't really get angry because, well, schools, you know, this or regulators, that. I'm like, no, I just follow the law and I just keep teaching and keep building, doing the best that I can, understanding that the technology will continue to change, the marketplace will continue to adapt and evolve. And in the end, you just have to have enough clients. You just have to have enough students to sustain a healthy, fairly consistent lifestyle, and then you just keep building. I don't know what effect it's going to have on the industry as a whole. My hope is it's very large, but at the same time, if I can reach out to a student like you and not even agree on everything, she's like, well, I like regulation. And I'm like, great. Why don't, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to help you. If I can help you with anything and you get something and all I charge you was seven bucks a month, I'm like gold, gold. Like my, my value proposition is extremely high when I'm helping therapists who need help, but I'm doing so for just seven bucks a month. And I think that that, I know like for me, like I know that you kept saying like, oh, reach out to me, I'm happy to help. And I was like, but are you? Like, this is your time. And well, cause I also oh. saw that, I think I saw that like you had, you had put on your website, like, you know, that you also do consults. So I'm like, okay, so what, at what point does it become 
all right, now I gotta charge you. And what point does it become stalking? And at what point are you just from like, me or from yeah, the students? I'll tell you this. For the like for the students, because I know I told you personally, I, I was like, I was like, just so you know, I will be stalking you now. Um so, and I, mean, I tell that depends. to most of my instructors. Well, it, it depends. It depends on how it comes across. The, the whole thing is like at a certain point you got you got time and money, right? So when you start to run out of time, usually money goes up and then you're using money to buy other people's time. So if I was too busy, no. But right now, I day drink <laughs> because we're in the middle of quarantine. So I'm like, thank God they'll do a podcast with me because I can, I can sort of you know, work while I'm not working. The, the whole thing is, too, when it comes to um, what to think of as an early adopter, the people in line um, at the, the iPhone store, uh, the Apple store, whenever they release the new iPhone, the people who camp out, those are the early adopters. Those are the students that I'm still working with. Because if I can build a rabid fan base of 100, 500, 1,000 students who will basically consume everything I do and just watch it, use it, tweak it, give me feedback, those early adopters spiral out because nobody's going to listen to just me i'm just some weird white guy in texas it's when you do it that it makes the impact in the overall marketplace whenever you say no i know you think robert gardner is a jerk but you don't understand what he's done that's when it shifts and changes does it make sense so are you like listening in on my conversations because some of these are exactly what i say about to like other people about how like i'm like i'm like you got, i was like i'm always like like because i'm kind of like you i know that you recently said like unless you're talking about like business or massage, like that's, that's all you're talking about. And that's kind of how I am. Like I'm talking about like business, massage, music. If it's not one of those, I really don't have time for you right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's all like, I, I had texted a random friend and was like, I was watching this YouTube video and he said that, you know, that entrepreneurship is for troublemakers. I was like, I'm the troublemaker. That's me. And he made, he took one of my pictures and wrote, they call me troublemaker. I'm like, yes, that's me. I'm like, I'm the troublemaker. And like, for me, like watching these videos, like sometimes, like, I remember like when I first started watching, I was like, I was like, oh, this, I, I like this. This is interesting. And then like, yes, sometimes you talk too much, but it's what I hear in between the talking, like the whole like troublemaker thing. I rewound it. And I was like, that's someone understands what I've been going through where everyone else has been almost like against me and saying that I'm, you know, trying to start a riot or I'm going against the owner. It's like, no, 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 it's not, it's not any of that. I just like, don't be stupid. Like see what's in front of you. See the potential that you have. If you could do this on your own, why wouldn't you? My, my students, I think the, the core students, you know, and I had to think about this, like who, who are those people? And it's like, they're a lot like very ethical pirates. <laughs> They, they resist authority, you know, they kind of want to go do their own thing, but they know we got to work together to get the ship to do what it's got to do. Mm -hmm. And they're just brazen, you know. Because I know, I, like me personally, I hate working for people. I hate working yeah. for people. Right now I have to because I moved to a state where I didn't know anyone. I had no idea what the laws were. Like I, I it was, it's a means to an end. I'm going to have to do it again when I move to LA because I know no one. I just know that I love the beach. I yeah. love the ocean. And so it's something that you, yeah, you definitely have to start off with, especially if, even if you ever even had like a little thought that maybe you'll own your business one day or you want to work for yourself, find out what to do and what not to do. I remember in cosmetology school, a lot of the girls were like, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to open a business. And one of, there was only one instructor that said, work for someone else first, because you're going to find out what you like and what you don't like. And that's how you're going to run your business. Yeah. So many pieces. I, I tell the students that, you know, if they want to work for Envy or they want to work for a large chain, I don't have any issue with that as long as they're happy with it. Mm -hmm. What I don't like is they're constantly complaining about the place they work, but they don't want to change it. Exactly. Yeah. And change is hard. Change is very hard, especially when you don't have that guarantee if anyone's going to follow you. There, there's really not, I mean, people will tell you that you are the best therapist ever and then they won't follow you, but some of them will and some of them will tell their friends. And I think especially working for a chain and not that I'm necessarily knocking it, it's not for me. Um, 
but I had a friend that I worked with um, at one of the chiropractors that I was at, and she was also working at a massage envy. And she put in her two weeks and they knew that she was working with someone else. She's like, I didn't even get a chance to tell them not where I was because I guess they have a non-compete, but just to tell them that I'm still going to be at the area. She's like, I didn't, they didn't even give me that chance. They just told me to get out. Yeah. So plan accordingly. If you do plan on doing that, just so you know, but <laughs> yeah, there's, there's more freedom in the industry minus the quarantine um, than at any time. You know, the therapist who helped get regulation, build uh, facilities like Massage Envy, make massage more reputable um, and above board, those people have a little bit of pushback sometimes because they, well, basically were resting on their shoulders. They helped create something that I'm going in and tweaking and modifying in a way that I think is more beneficial for what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to teach but there's more of a time now for diversity in the marketplace. You know, it's like, you can focus on relaxation, you can focus on medical, you can focus on chronic pain, you can focus on a geriatric or um, a senior's population. There's more options now than there was say 20 years ago, which was the year mm -hmm. 2000. And then 20 years before that, that was 1980. It was not, it was not the same industry at that time. Things no. have changed a lot in the last 20 years. And that's the thing is that, especially now people are, because they're more exposed to it, they're more open to it. Um, and there are people that are still not. And that's just always going to be the thing. I worked with a therapist who I remember, and her mother is just the sweetest woman ever. And um, she said that when she told her mom that she wanted to become a massage therapist, her mom cried. Yeah. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, she started crying. And I was like, why? She's like, I don't know. And I was like, okay. And the, I mean, went to school with a girl who her dad also was like disgusted with the fact that she was going to be a therapist. So there's still that out there, but there are way more people that are more accepting of it. Um, especially out here, like where I live now in Minnesota, um, this state is very um, health conscious forward. Mm -hmm. And so is the insurance. Um, especially like car insurance, like here, as of right now, if you get into a car accident, um, it's a no fault state, but your insurance will pay for everything. Massage, acupuncture, all your x-rays, all your doctor visits, up to X amount of money, but they're, they're recognizing massage and alternative therapies as helpful and beneficial and people want it because people want to get better. Yeah. The other side of the coin is when we talked about regulation earlier is that if states are regulated, massage is sort of standardized. It's going to be easier for them to get into the medical situation and system to be able to bill insurance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to have anything to do with that in any way, shape or form. I want to be able to go direct to my clients, charge cash, be done. Um, and that's what I push, not because I don't want people to have massage available via insurance, but I don't want to be able to do it myself. Um, and my work is, I mean, straight up medical. Like if doctors referred people to me, they'd probably be surprised the number of people mm -hmm. I know. But um, I just don't like being under somebody's thumb and then telling me, because if you're billing insurance, they're going to tell you how long the session can be and what you can work on. And it's like all this other stuff you have to deal with instead of just interacting with you, finding out what the issue is, helping you with the problem and having you pay me directly. I'd prefer to cut out the middleman as much as possible. Though I know for a lot of therapists, they want insurance billing because they think it gives us an area of legitimacy. Do you still give, like, would you provide a receipt so that they can bill insurance themselves? That's happened before, like a handful it of has. times. Yeah. And it depends on their insurance company and how that works. Yeah, I just wondered because um, I, I wonder more as you start rebranding, if once students start picking up on this, if they go to build the insurance, how it's going to play out because it technically will not have the word massage in it. The biggest issue is the therapists. I mean, if you just took my work and said, well, it's myofascial release, which you could. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't have any problem with that. Um, you know, it's like, I, I tell people sometimes that I think modalities are failed brands in the massage marketplace. 
So no, like nobody quite knows what myofascial release is. Yeah. It's like a colloquial way it's used and therapists have a general idea. But then it's like, okay, are you doing myofascial release where you slide or you do myofascial release where you just grab, like dry, like, you know, and, and they get into these semantic arguments and discussions about it. Um, I don't really try to get the therapist just to do exactly what I do. I really just go, listen, this is the range of tools that I use. This is what I think you might be able to do, what I think might be easiest. And then I help the student modify that to make it fit their own practice in whatever way they want. Like if you, if you decide, I don't like mat work, you know, I just want to work on a table. I'm like, great, let's just go help people on a table. So long as you're happy with that and the clients are happy with it, great. When it comes to what you put on soap notes, it, we're just manipulating soft tissue. There's nothing magic about the way I'm using an elbow. Um, I have a kind of a broader set of tools because I'm using my knees and feet and sometimes multiple points of contact on a mat. But in the end, it still it falls under the scope and practice of what most people would consider massage or soft tissue manipulation. That makes sense. So how did you wind up in Minnesota? You like the beach. <laughs> I love the ocean and I feel like I am waiting to go back home. Yeah. Um, so the plan was not to come out to Minnesota. The plan was just to go to LA. Yeah. And I had a friend that was like, why don't you come out here? And I was like, no, there's snow there. It's colder than here. No. And they were like, why don't you just try it a little bit and just come out and save a little bit more money because LA is expensive and it is. They charge you 10 cents per plastic bag. Yeah. I was like, can I get a bag? And they're like, it's 10 cents. I was like, I'll carry it. It's fine. <laughs> walking down the beach like this with all my stuff in hand it's, it's okay yeah. um which i had no idea when i had first gone out there um so i was like okay so now i'm saving like every plastic bag that i get from the store um so yeah it was it's just at this point um just a pit stop but yeah it's cold it snowed yesterday it snowed today Ooh. like <laughs> yeah i am like when will this end snow on easter or day after it, yeah and on easter snowstorm yesterday snowstorm today it, i'm just anything well, under 80 is freezing to me so i'm dying no oh yeah yeah well growing up in louisiana and now living in austin it's like it's it's scorching in summer but you learn how to hibernate in the air conditioning so yeah um, you know as a as a subscriber do you have any like specific questions about stuff that you've run across in the vault or i mean because we're sitting just having a conversation are there things that you wanted to ask me since you have me here live um Mainly, I think the the one thing that I had said was um, in, and I haven't gotten to it yet in the subscription part where um, you have your business stuff. Mm -hmm. I was like, talk about doing independent contractor versus employee work, because yeah. I don't think that that's something that a lot of people know about. Mm -hmm. And I know I personally have gotten completely fucked over because I didn't know. Um, and actually it helped me at the place that I'm at now because they have me as an employee but they're like but you only get paid for the massages that you do yeah and i'm like well what about all the other time like when i'm doing like my soap notes and flipping over the table like i just don't get paid for that i was like you can't keep me here if you're not paying me so i was able to work out a deal where they pay me hourly and then every massage i do is a bonus which yeah. was even better because um like when i first started i was i was beyond booked they didn't have a therapist for two months um, the two therapists that they had before were just completely inappropriate, not during the sessions with what they did, but like things that they would say. And I'm like, this is what happens when you're not regulated. <laughs> and so <laughs> some of the horror stories that I've heard, I'm just like, like what? And so there's this thing called Minnesota nice. Mm -hmm. People will not tell you how they really feel. <laughs> so I'm not the kidding. Close, I'm close to Canada. <laughs> I, basically, I'm not kidding. I thought when I had first heard that, I thought it was like, uh, like I thought like people had just like coined it. I didn't know that it was an actual thing until I came <laughs> and I got, I had an interview and they literally said, there's this thing called Minnesota Nice. I'm like, wait, it's actually a thing. They won't tell you how they actually feel about you. Um, and so these therapists, like one of them, I guess was eating chips during the session. Um, like, <laughs> One of them was talking inappropriate stuff with like the patients about like her son's love life. And I was like, 
what? And the owner was like, I had no idea until they left. No one said a thing. <laughs> and I was like, and I remember one of the, one of the patients ended up telling me, you know, that like one of the girls was saying, you know, everything that was going on in her life. And I was like, why do you tell the owner? He's like, what was I supposed to say? Oh, hey, did you hear what's going on in her life today? And I was like, no, but tell I was like, how uncomfortable were you? He's like, I was this, very uncomfortable. I'm like, why this, didn't you say anything? This is why I don't run a brick and mortar. And this is why I've not hired massage therapists because I would be the guy sitting down writing, you cannot eat tortilla chips during your... <laughs> right? I was just like, how did like, and then like your hands and... I'm such a germaphobe. Like when this whole COVID thing started, I had no idea it was going on because I'm always washing my hands. I always have hand sanitizer. I had no idea why hand sanitizer was sold out everywhere. Like I was like, what's going on? I had no idea. <laughs> but um, I was so overwhelmed when I started because people didn't have a therapist for two months. So I was book solid from day one. And I had no time to do like my notes and stuff. And I remember asking someone else, I was like, how did the other therapists do it? And they were like, I don't know. I just know that they would stay here really, really late. And I was like, without getting paid? Yeah. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, ooh. Yeah, so the, the, the line, and I'm, I'm not completely clear on this. It's been a while since I've been an employee. Uh, when you're a 1099 or an independent contractor, they can't tell you what to wear, I don't think, unless it's specific to what you're doing. Um, they can't necessarily tell you when to show up again, unless it's specific to what you're doing. Um, they can't, you know, make you stay when you're not working. Like you were talking about filling out soap notes, that sort of thing. There's a lot of rules about how that functions. Generally what I'll do is try as much as I can to get therapists to get an accountant, um, to get, you know, financial, uh, advice that they can for something like taxes due to the IRS, and then also just to manage those situations. But I admit I'm not an expert on the differences between employees and contractors. There's, the other difference um, is that, you know, the contractors, they don't take any taxes out. No, yeah. and that's, that, and that was, I remember, um, I worked somewhere else and they had me be an independent contractor. And um, I remember like, the person that was interviewing me was like, you know what that is, right? And I was like, yeah, now I know what it is. At the time, I thought I knew what it was. She's like, yeah, you just pay your own taxes. That's it. I didn't realize that you're basically renting that room is what you do as an independent contractor. But they were still treating me as an employee, which is highly illegal. But I didn't know until I left. So at that point, it was lots too late. Of, yeah, lots of debate and discussion about that. It comes up on Facebook forums for massage therapists regularly. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started years ago, I didn't know anything about it. I was a contractor, but being treated like an employee. Um, it's happened several times. And uh, it's gotten better over the years uh, as I've been in the industry longer. But part of the reason I went out on my own was I just wanted to do the practice the way I thought it should be done. And the only way I could do that was to harness the business stuff and learn how to do it and then hire people for the taxes and what, what I had to do. So I just prefer that because one, I think if you're willing to do the work, you're making more money working independently and you also have the maximum amount of freedom. And the second part was what I cared about the most. Um, I really was trying to develop a new service that could, didn't exist in facilities. The chiropractor's office I last worked in, I had a good working relationship there, but they were not. I had pushed as far as I could get. I was doing MAP-based work there. 80% of my client base was MAP-based. We were billing insurance for all the sessions, 30 minutes an hour, but I couldn't, I couldn't shove. I had to do that in private practice. And that's the thing is that that's a big reason why I hate working for people is because I feel like I actually drew my friend a picture on a dry erase board and it was a box, a stick figure, two stars, and then stars all around the box. And it was like the stick figure was like kicking. And I said, this is how I feel at work. Yeah. I have all of these tools and I can only do this. And I always feel like because they dictate, you know, how long the sessions are or how, you know, the max and the minimum that you can do and how much your turnover time is. And I always feel like I'm rushing people out. Yeah. So I can't even like give people like, I can't properly give people homework because my next person's waiting for me. 
And even if they are early, which my people tend to always be early, apparently people cannot tell time here. It's your appointment is at 2.30, <laughs> stop showing up at 2.03 when I am eating my lunch, thank you. Yeah. Um, every single time, they're, they'll, they're, even if they are 20 minutes early, I feel like I'm running behind. So I'm like, well, now I gotta get you out and I gotta get the next person in. So I always feel like I cannot give the person, I don't wanna say my undivided attention, because obviously when I'm in the room I do, and but I always feel like I'm rushing and I just can't give them the best service that I possibly can. Yep, and that, my job at the chiropractor's office, 30 minutes or an hour. And how much intimacy connection could I develop in that time? It was like speed dating, you know? Especially when you're doing medical base, I feel like yeah. you need more time. Like when yep. people have nothing to work on, like it, it's so funny because when I first started, I was like, oh, well, I already do hair and makeup. I'm totally going to be in the spa. I'm going to be doing relaxing stuff. It's going to be great. And then once I got more into like the medical stuff, I was like, now when people are like, oh, I don't have anything. I'm like, why are you wasting my time? <laughs> because I feel like I cannot fill up that hour. I'm just yeah. like, can I find something? Like, are you okay with me finding something? Because I'm sure I can find something. Longer, okay, sessions, fine. longer sessions allowed me to relax the client more. It allowed me to be extremely thorough in the problem areas that we're having issues with. It provided more space to connect with the client uh, related to their, you know, personal like pain levels. Um, doing a three-hour session was gold because, and having home-based practice, it meant I saw two clients a day. I looked like a really good drug dealer. They show up, stay for three hours, go home, like swerving because they're so mm -hmm. relaxed. Um, that worked really well for me. And what it also did was it it meant that I did something that was so different that they couldn't go get it anywhere else. The people, not everybody liked it, but everybody who did was rabid. And that was what I needed in private practice. Did you know, so how did you know that you wanted to do three hour sessions? So here's, here's what happened. I had the stable, solid job at the chiropractic office, 12 hours a week, only 12 hours. Solid, stable, consistent, 12 hours. All the rest of my time was private practice. I was running both simultaneously. And I went wild and crazy because I had a home studio, two hours. That was all I did. It was only mat based, it was only two hours. After doing this for quite some time, I had a handful of clients and I was using enough techniques and, and working in such a way that I went, I, I'm, I was edging on three sometimes. So I took a handful of my regular clients and just started giving them three hour sessions, not charging them for it, just giving them three hours. And I did it for a month or six weeks and a couple of my clients, I said, listen, I've been giving you three hours instead of two. And they're like, yeah, you know, I noticed that. I'm like, well, thank you, You're not been, you've not been charging me extra. And I'm like, no, I was running a test. I'm like, if you had a choice between the two hour and three hour, what would you choose? And they're like, oh dude, three hours, awesome. I'm like, done. <laughs> and that was how I changed it on the menu of services and just made it three hours to get it over with. The other thing was it stood out. And in a very crowded marketplace full of massage, you can get massage anywhere. It was like three hours close on mat base. He called it a reboot. What the hell is this guy doing? Yeah. Where did you get people when you were still at the chiropractor? Um, primarily the way that that worked was I was running the time massage jam here in Austin. So I was going out once a week, every Thursday night, basically giving away education body work for free that one night a week um, from like, 8 p.m. until 1 a.m. in the morning. We sometimes have like 20 or 30 people hanging out with me doing work. You'll see video at the time of size channel on our YouTube mm -hmm. channel. So I was engaging in this in-person networking locally with the community that was interested. And then at the same time, I was building the website, the blog, the YouTube channels, and I was drawing people who were looking for time massage. It was a very small sliver of the marketplace. But because places were not offering time massage, I was consistently showing up on the first page when people searched mm -hmm. for that. And when they would watch YouTube videos or check my Instagram, they had generally a favorable opinion of me. I focused so much on writing blog posts about carpal tunnel syndrome and blog posts about sciatica and videos that you didn't have to get everybody, but if you had 100 people and then five people became clients, you were gold. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I had wondered that because you always talk about how like, you're like, yeah, I was at the chiropractor's office. And then I also had all these other people. I'm like, where did these people come from? Yeah. And it's also, yeah. 
just building uh, networking and connections. When I had a client that was say like you, and they were the ideal client, when the session was over, I would give them business cards and say, listen, Chris, I had such a great time working with you. You are the cool client. You're the client I need 10 more of. Do you have friends who are as cool as you? Can you please give them this card and I'll give them like 10% off their first session or something like that? Because you were trying to use that network to try to draw mm -hmm. more people into what you were doing. Yeah, I, I was fortunate when I was in Chicago because when I was in the chiropractor's office, the last chiropractor that I worked for, um, we randomly had a medical doctor that came in. He had a group on and came in and um, the chiropractor like runs out of the office that he was just in with him and he comes over and he goes, uh, just so you know, um, so you're about to get this guy. And I'm like, okay. okay. And like, like at this point he's scaring me. So now I'm like starting to like shake. And he's like, and he's a medical doctor. And I was like, ah, oh. he's like, so he's probably gonna be quizzing you. I'm like, great. So I should come in. I was like, hi, come on over, come, come, come into my office. And um, massage him, was shaking and sweating the entire time because I was like, he's gonna be convincing me and this is gonna be awful. And um, he was like, so what do you recommend? He's like, like once a week, every two weeks. And so I told him and I was like, yeah, I would recommend you come back next week. And I didn't know that he had like the three group on. Yeah. And he came back the following week and he goes, um, I was in pain for over 30 years of my life. And after seeing you last week, I'm out of pain now. He's like, I never thought I'd feel that in my life. Yeah. And I was like, oh, he's like, so and thank he's you. A, and he's a doctor. And he started and recommending is, everyone to come over. Yep. And it's, it's nothing to like, I'm not looking down on Western medical practitioners. I'm very science-based, pro-research. The medical community doesn't know what we do. Yes. Yeah. And that was the thing is that he had been in pain for so long and he part of the reason why he came to us was number one his wife kept nagging him um and his daughter had come in for a massage with a different therapist that had left so had that therapist been there i wouldn't have seen him but he said he came in also because he's like i want to refer my patients out because i don't want to have to prescribe them medication yeah we were like whoa you you do what for a living and what did you just say He's like, yeah. He's like, I don't want that. And I remember asking mom, I was like, you were in pain for over 30 years and you never, I mean, you're a medical doctor. You didn't prescribe yourself anything. He's like, so I'm going to take something that could possibly end up killing me at some point and just numb the pain for the rest of my life. And I was like, you get it. Yeah. But he would also have people come in that he would send me and they would come in. And of course they would tell me that Dr. So-and-so sent them. And I was like, and I already knew. And I was like, it got to the point where I had to be like, okay, just so you know, I'm a miracle worker. Results may not be typical. And they were always like, we were told that you were. And I was like, yeah. no, 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 we gotta stop that. Because yes, I wanna set the expectations, but I wanna set the expectations. Because if I can't help you and I have to refer you out, I don't want you to feel like I failed you because I had to refer you out. Because you're not failing someone by referring them out. You're doing them a service. If you can't help them, yeah. you have to refer them out. Yeah. Some of the most successful stuff I've done. And when I say most successful, what I mean is I think some people would look at this as a failure, but I had a gentleman come in and I think he was a triathlete and cycled and he had pain running down the back of one of his legs. Normally it's pure form of syndrome. They got a tight ass, got to work on their gluteals, get it to soften up and then the pain goes away. I worked on him and his response, even after a three hour session was he was about two points maybe on a pain scale. And I was like, not good. And I said, listen, if you do not improve past that two, and in fact your pain comes back or gets worse in the next day or two, you need to go see a doctor. My concern is, and I'm not trying to scare you in any way, but my concern is you may have a herniated disc in your lumbar spine that's pressing on that nerve trunk and it's further up the chain. Like I can't do anything about that. And I'm not trying to scare you, just, you know, whatever. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call and it was him. And he's like, you were absolutely right. Like the pain shot back up. I wouldn't saw the doctor. I've got a herniated disc. That is manual therapy. And it's mm -hmm. pattern recognition from working with people, knowing that if it had just been soft tissue, he would have proved probably much more than just that two points on a scale. And it's not trying to, make them feel like, oh, it's the end of the world if you have a herniated disc. It's like, no, but you'll probably need to see a physical therapist or someone who can help you with that much more specifically. 
yeah, which is perfect. It's it's always it's always about them. It has to be that way because yeah. we're not doing our job if we're not focused on them. If we're just focused on, oh well, I didn't fix it this time, so I must be doing something wrong. It's like no, not necessarily. I mean, bodies are complex. The uh, the stuff that I learn from is the stuff where you don't fix it, so to speak. Um, the the challenging you know people you work with who frankly have conditions that I have to go to Google and do research and go, what is mm-hmm. Gillian Barr syndrome? You know, or what is, you know, this issue or that? Occasionally people come to me with things where I've literally just got to do Google research to try to find out more about it. You know, if it's an autoimmune condition, they've got ehlers danlos syndrome or, you know, whatever else. Yeah, definitely. And, the, and the, I think um, patients and clients really appreciate when you say, Oh, I looked up this and I was able to find this for you. And I've even seen it, um, not necessarily just with me, but even like the acupuncturist I work with, I've, you know, heard her talk to her patients and she was like, yeah, I did a little bit of research and this was what I was able to find for you. And people are like, thank you for taking, you know, your personal time to look this up for me. And it's like, well, like, yeah, that's what we're here for. Like, we, we want you to get better. We're here for you. Yeah. Um, when I worked at the chiropractor's office, I, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I teach is just what I do. I'm just packaging what I've already done. But you remember how you said you had to flip clients so fast you couldn't teach them self-care? I went, huh, I can put a video on my YouTube channel and then just send them to my YouTube channel. So I started doing that, and I would just walk up to an anatomy chart and go, listen, this is your infraspinatus. It's just a muscle that connects from here to here. It's bothering your shoulder. If you lay on a tennis ball right here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a link to a video I put on YouTube for it. They would tip higher and say, wow, I've never had a massage therapist educate me before. And I went, wow, that's all I had to do? <laughs> I, actually, I actually took that. And because when I did have the time, and when, sometimes I do have the time, it's not always that I'm you know, going so fast, but usually I don't, I don't have the time and I'm running over. Um, but I actually have been wanting to make stretching videos for years. And I was always like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Never did it. Finally made one this past week. It's the worst thing I've ever put out in my entire <laughs> life. There was like buzzing from like the camera mic. And like I said, I went to say neck and I like pointed to my shoulders and I was like, yep, that happened. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to put it out there because I hope that other people see it and, you know, will find me and that it'll help other people. I mean, I want it to help whomever it can, but I'm like, if I don't put this out, I'm never going to end up doing another one. And I'm just never end up doing it. And mainly it's for my clients and patients that have seen me. So I'm like, if other people rag on me for it, it's fine. I'm like, I know who it's supposed to go to. They know what I mean. And obviously my clientele, they know me, you know, personally or whatever. So they know the type of person I am. But yeah, I, I just look at it and oh, it's so bad. Talk but I kept me. thinking about how you were like, you were like, don't wait until it's perfect. And I'm like, ooh, but this is pretty rough. Yeah, but so if, if you go back to my YouTube channel, you can go watch my first YouTube video. It was pretty rough. <laughs> the difference is you don't have to like get rid of the old videos unless they're just so horrible. They should be there. Um, you just make better ones. Yeah. Nobody That's remembers. what I figured. I was like, I was like, at some point, I was like, I'll, I'll revamp it and it'll be fine. But yeah, yeah. I mean, when I'm talking and I I flub and say a word wrong and I laugh or those things actually add an element of humanity to the video. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes you more approachable and connectable. You know, like I had an educator tell me, and they're like, oh man, I'm kind of gaining weight, and I'm, you know this and that. You know, I don't I don't think I look good on camera, and I'm like, dude, just document document your weight loss journey. And they were like, oh, yeah. whoa, I'm like, yeah, get on camera and say, listen, I'm fat. <laughs> I don't exercise. I'm trying to exercise. You know, I'm going to document the process of me not only teaching, but also trying to lose weight. The thing is, what I think it does is it humanizes your brand. You know, it humanizes you as a person. You said you like music. You know, if you oh, reference yes. the bands that you like or music that you like and you're like, if anybody comes in here and requests Leonard Skinner, get out. <laughs> or whatever it is. You know, it just adds like nuance. Like I um, I did some yoga classes recently and I actually played something on YouTube and it was the Steely from the Grateful Dead. And I put that in the YouTube, I'm sorry, in the Instagram video because I could do that. It wouldn't flag it as like, you know, Grateful Dead music because it was a live show. 
But when people see that, if there are Grateful Dead fans, it allowed me to tag those people in Instagram. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, like, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon. Like, I'll teach a class. I do this all the time. Because sometimes some of those videos will wind up on YouTube. And if I have, like, a Topo Chico, which is, like, a fizzy water here in Austin, it's like I'll, 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 I'll make, like, a Twitter post and I'll tag Topo Chico because I'm trying to get him to sponsor me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, stuff could happen. So, yeah. I mean, you know, so like right now I'm wearing a time massage jam t shirt, but sometimes I'll wear like a Pink Floyd t shirt or reference mm -hmm. music that I like. And it's also, it's, it's brand. It really is branding you, Chris. You know, whatever it is you like specifically. Like, what kind of music are you into? Metal. I actually wore a Nine Inch Nails shirt purposely because I did want to have that element of me. And it's funny because, like, you know, I have my spa music, which I really actually do like having during my massages. And people are like, so what do you listen to when you get out of here? I'm like, metal. They're like, no, you don't. I'm like, oh, yeah. I, like, <laughs> literally almost got my skull crushed when I saw Metallica. They're like, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, I, that's, that's me. And I'm always up at the barricade and I, like, get gifts from the bands because I'm up there so much that they recognize me. And I wore a Nine Inch Nails shirt and I showed, I showed my video to one of my friends. I'm like, tell me what you think. I'm like, well, be honest. He's like, oh, it's very professional. And then like a few hours later, he texts me again. He goes, was that a Nine Inch Nails shirt? And I was like, yeah, it's from their goodbye tour in 2009, even though I saw them again a few years ago. But I wanted, I didn't want it to be just, here's some facts. I want it to be, here's some facts from me to you. Yep, the, the, the from me to you the personal connection what i think is so interesting is massage therapists know that we have a business that relies on connection but the massage therapists are fighting digital connection because what we normally do is in in private it's behind closed doors so to now have to basically put a face to it it's like well now what do i do who am i it's like the every time that i have to fill out an about me area I'm like, who the fuck am I? What do I, what do, I do? <laughs> well, I mean, well, I sat back years ago, and one of the things that I noticed was when I was working on, like, teaching and selling what I did and, and branding and all the marketing and the stuff I wasn't really good at at that time. Um, I didn't, like, what am, you know, I was trying to figure it out. And I said, don't worry about whether it's Thai. Don't worry about where it came from. You know, what characteristics does it have? And two of the main things that stood out were the fact that it was clothes on and it was mat based. And just those two things, when I just took those categories and I went, okay, so it's on a mat, the people are clothed. And it finally clicked where I went, you could photo and video document everything. Everything. You could film all of your sessions, the actual sessions you do, and, and like use that in social media. That thing, Close on mat based introduces a piece of a marketing package that basically allows us to produce a hundred times more footage than other massage therapists. Mm -hmm. Way huge, massive reach if the therapists are willing to take out their phone and just document what they're doing. It's going to get to the point uh, once we're past quarantine, I'm likely going to open up my studio, uh, reach out to my local community, and go, Hey, are you in pain? and just give away our sessions, but I live stream them. Mm. So what happens is they come in and they say, I got upper back and neck pain. I'm like, ah, oh, done, we just need an hour, come here. And I'll just kick their ass on camera and keep putting that out and keep putting it out and keep putting it out. But here's what happens. When they get an hour, which I can give away, an hour is what most people do is a full massage. If I give them an hour, they're gonna ask me, can I get a full session with you? <laughs> Yeah, I just feel like watching your videos and like just seeing like what you had to say. And I remember like early on, like I don't know what I saw. It must have been a YouTube video where you were in the car and you were filming yourself and you're like, I don't understand why people don't just film themselves. You're like, yeah, I look like this or that. But I mean, who cares? My stuff is out there. Just do it. And like, and I was like, yeah, just do it. And then I get inside of myself and I was like, no, oh, it's got to be perfect. And then there was a YouTube video where you were like, it doesn't have to be perfect. I was like, hmm, I'm not a Virgo. So then I like, hmm, and hot about her forever. And then quarantine came and I was like, 
this is this is the universe's way of being like either you do it now or you're just not going to do it yeah. so i was like all right i'm studying i'm watching a subscription service i like ran to the library and grabbed books and like dvds on like massage i was like anything that i could find any live classes being put out i'm like this is the time to do it yeah. and then i did my video my very awful video but i did it and i remember telling my friend i was like I did it. It's supposed to get easier from here, right? And he's like, yeah. He's like, once you get one, he's like, that's what you need to do. What social media platforms are you using right now? So I'm on Instagram and I have a Facebook page. I just don't got on actual Facebook. Okay. Um, and then Twitter. Okay. Are you using Twitter heavily? No. Okay. Not I a lot mainly of use it to read. Twitter. Yeah. Not a lot of therapists are on Twitter. Um, I have problems getting traction from therapists, but I interact with other entrepreneurs there. Yeah, that's about it. And it's even like Instagram, like I mainly just use it for a while as like information in. Like I didn't even follow anyone until like two weeks ago. What kind of population range are your ideal clients? Like target market, like age range? Um, Probably... See, out here is different because of the market out here is different. So I know that when I move, the market is going to be different as well. So age is not necessarily what I'm looking for, but if you're in pain, I want to see you. Okay. It'll be a little bit more challenging to draw people for that specifically on Twitter. Not impossible. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to figure out is if, you know, so people, and they have to be at least 18. Are you working yeah. on people over 65? Yes. Lots of them? Not a lot, okay. but I do have some that are like, most of your I can't believe you still clients, have your license. Yeah. Most of your ideal clients, what social media are they using? Because that's what you do. I have no idea. I've never asked them. So you have a website, right? Yes. Okay, so um, one, you can use your Facebook business page, you can Facebook Live, you can download mm -hmm. that video and upload it to YouTube. YouTube's gonna give you some increased search engine optimization, that's pretty good. You're gonna wanna take that video and put it on your website and blog form. That's what I did with my last one. Yeah, and then you're just gonna wanna repeat or my that. only one, my last one, like I have as many as you do. Yeah, YouTube, um, especially search engine stuff, keywords. So if you work on carpal tunnel or neck pain or those sorts of things, you want to show up in local searches in Minnesota for that. Um, it also means it's going to go with you because if you move to L.A. later, it's going to show up that you're in L.A. and it's going to recalibrate all of that. Does that make sense? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, yeah, I just... Twitter is like a big dinner party. Um, do you do you like social media? Funny videos? Yeah. TikTok. Now. <laughs> TikTok. If I see one more half naked chick dancing in the corner of my screen. Oh, that's a problem for me because I like, like I like half naked chicks. And I'm like, Robert, you can't go like and talk to every cute girl on TikTok. This is they're not even of age half the time. Like stop. Exactly. But the thing is like, like, I'm like Yeah. So it's like TikTok, Snapchat. And, when my sister first showed me that, I was like, oh my gosh, literally four hours of me laughing. And I said, I will never get this because if I do, I will never do anything else ever again for the rest of my so life. Look at TikTok differently. And as a platform, understand this. Like I am still getting, you know, cute girls on my feed, but lots of funny historical reenactments, uh, little comedy skits based on history. Maybe 20 the stuff that you're putting on your story? No, 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 no. So, so yeah, so when you see my Instagram stories, I'm sharing a lot of times from my TikTok when I find something interesting, something that's okay. funny or notable. And it means that I'm, I'm cushioning business content with funny stuff from other people that I'm trying to support their exposure. But 25% of the videos that I get on TikTok are financial advice. Oh, really? Okay. Stock tips, information about index funds. I don't share all of those all the time. But that's a lot of what flows through my TikTok feed based on its algorithm. The difference is TikTok and the way that it interacts, like the dynamics are just, it makes you, because you know, for instance, that Instagram is very different than Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then Instagram and Twitter are really different than YouTube. Yes. But TikTok is the most cutting edge. TikTok is where social media is going. TikTok is an amazing platform. If you just started making, you know, 
So look at it this way. So you know that TikTok will allow you to put music in your videos. Yes. Okay. So I want you to go find all the metal you can, Metallica, Nine Inch Nails, whatever you can pull and make massage based videos on TikTok. Okay. You see where I'm going? No. I mean, yes, but no. Here's so, the thing. So here's what, let me tell you why I don't like TikTok. So <laughs> <laughs> that just happened. Um, so I remember watching TikTok and all I see are just kids, like literally kids, half naked chicks. I'm not half naked, but just a dancing and kids. And I was like, what is this? And one of my friends is their vines. He's like, they're going back to, to vines, which yeah. I never got into vines to begin with. And now I'm like, can everyone stop dancing? Just like two seconds of no dancing. Cause that's all I see. TikTok will give you more organic reach than all those other platforms right now. Okay. Even more than Instagram. Yes. Okay. Almost positive. How many followers do you have on Instagram? Not a lot. So I'll, I'll tell you what I I've think seen. I might have like 14. Like yeah. I'm not even kidding. So I, I'll, I'll look at uh, people on TikTok. I'll look at their profile and there'll be like an attractive young lady did a dance, something like that. And I'll check her profile. And when they press the drop down menu, it'll show her Instagram and her YouTube. I'll go to their Instagram and YouTube and they have paltry followings. They've got like 3 million views on TikTok why just because it's something new or because i heard that instagram had the most users so is it because instagram it's might have the most users quick? but instagram is owned by facebook mm -hmm. yeah they Tick, didn't they tiktok is competing that? tiktok is competing with all these other platforms and tiktok says show this to more people because they're building an ad platform what they're doing is right now they're allowing more organic reach i can post something uh, do you know who ambrose beers is mm -mm. Ambrose Bierce is a, a, a guy, kind of Civil War era. He was a, a veteran, very cynical. He wrote a book called The Devil's Dictionary. It's got all these completely satirical definitions in it. And I'm literally going through it letter by letter and reading excerpts from Ambrose Bierce on my TikTok. Okay. People can make a TikTok video. If that video goes viral, they can get millions of views from that one little 15 second TikTok or whatever, a minute long. The reason I would like you to look at it is I think this is where social media is going. And I think because of the amount of time you're going to spend on it, it's very quick. It's just a minute. It's like, it would be like, you know, like you playing some Pantera or Sepultura or whatever you should listen to. I like Pantera. I grew up with Pantera. Um, you know, and okay. digging an elbow into somebody to metal music. Most massage therapists don't think of that as massage related content, but on TikTok, is it funny? Is it notable? Is it interesting? Is it something that drew them to you? You know, it's a perfect platform when it comes to music because you're a music fan. Here's the deal. You know how people are discovering new music? Yes. TikTok. Musicians are uploading sections of their songs to TikTok, encouraging people to make videos to their music and then sharing it across social media. Okay. Instagram. Look into it. Here's Instagram. the thing is that you, if you say it at this point, I'm just like, all right, you tell me to hop on one leg. I'm there. Yeah. I mean, just, just play with it. Like, listen, I, I sit down at night sometimes. I'm not lying. I sit down at night and I'm like, okay, I got 15 minutes and two hours later, I'm still playing on TikTok. See, that's what I don't want. I don't want to be on there forever. This is why I don't have Snapchat because I'm not going to get anything else done. I, I got when the Samsung 8 Plus came out, I got it and it had the filters and we had come out to Minnesota for a festival and we had gone out to eat when we came in before we went to my sister's friends to sleep so that we could start the festival the next day. And they, they were like leaving me behind because I was too busy making myself into a penguin that would eat a fish when you open the mouth. And I was like, this is why I don't have snappies. This right here. I don't know. I, I love it. I, I think it, it's amazing. I, when I first started using Snapchat and then I saw the filters for the first time, because this is before Instagram started using them, Snapchat was like, wow, augmented yeah. reality. I was like, this is nuts. And then all of a sudden, all the other platforms started, you know, morphing. And then TikTok came out. And I was like, what the hell is this? And I was like, Oh my God, 
like it keeps, you know, changing in various ways. But what, what I think it does is it makes you look at social media differently. It okay. makes you look at content and production differently. Um, an easy to use app that has its own internal editing that's simple to make feathers float over, you know, whatever you're doing or whatever augmented reality. It creates a lot of opportunity for creative stuff that as a platform, you know, I don't release all the time those Ambrose beers things on other platforms because it's specific to TikTok. You know, it would be looking okay. for somebody who was interested. Um, another TikToker, oh man, she came in and she does... She wrote a book about etymology, which is like word origins. I'm a total geek about language related to etymology, especially from anatomy, which is like Latin and Greek typically. Mm -hmm. And she does entire like minute long little TikToks on different words and their origins. I'm a total geek. I'm a total fan girl. I'm like, yeah, I'm like commenting on their videos, Yay! talking about it, recommending words they should do the etymology on just because the videos are so good. That's really particular content to that platform. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to look into it. And it's, it's um, also, you know, it's not just like people look at it and go, well, I can't sell something on TikTok. Like I wouldn't guarantee that you'd get a client because mm -hmm. of TikTok. But if you can make funny stuff on TikTok, you can share that video across your other platforms. So yeah, that's getting, what I was going to ask. You're getting a Twitter follower. And, and TikTok right now, they have it structured so that it's easy to share on other platforms. So it's easy to, to go to your Facebook stories and have music in it, by the way. And it's easy to go into Twitter. It's easy to share it. You know, I did one with like Little Peep, uh, Little Peep's a rapper that I discovered recently because of a Netflix documentary. And I made one in class and put it on my YouTube, but they flagged it because of the music in it. But I didn't care. Because uh, the, you know, because people may be doing, you know, Little Peep research or something, but somehow YouTube collates if they're interested in massage mm -hmm. and shows them my video. So one of the things about being a music fan is like I couldn't include music on Facebook videos or Instagram or YouTube because they would flag it. Right. TikTok okay. is the music platform. It's like people are discovering music through TikTok. Little Nas X, Little Nas X and Old Town Road went viral on TikTok. That's how it got so that big. Damn song. So that song actually, do you, do you know where he got his music from? No. Like the music for it? No. Um, Nine Inch Nails. He, he oh, got yes. it from Trent Reznor. Yeah, he actually, Trent Reznor uploaded the song and Lil Nas X found it and he put the lyrics to it. And um, so they, I think they all ended up getting awards for it. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've sat down with TikTok. Do you know who the shags are? No. Oh, so like I'm, a, uh, I'm kind of a music geek from ways back when, but um, Frank Zappa and then there was this band called the Shags. And the Shags is like, to most people, it's horrible, but I just love it. I just think it's the most interesting stuff. But I found like several, uh, they wrote a song called My Pal Foot Foot, these little teenage girls. This was like in 1965 in like New Hampshire. And My Pal Foot Foot is about their imaginary friend named Foot Foot, that they made a little okay. song with the sisters. And I found that song on TikTok so I could make a video specifically to that. Because the Shags is such a weird nuance of like, you know, cultural ephemera. Like only people who were looking for that might find it. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I, I think that the social media platforms are fun. Increasingly, what I would have you do is I want you to consume enough of it to understand its place in the marketplace, but I want you to mm -hmm. use social media to produce. But what has happened is, you know, Trent Reznor, when Trent Reznor started, probably had to use computers and software that weren't nearly, nearly as developed as they are now. Mm -hmm. to produce that music and now what you have the capacity to do with this is like way past what Trent is dealing with like yeah. there are kids in, in grammar school who are playing with software that is likely as powerful as what Trent started with yeah yeah it's, it's crazy it's, it's ridiculous what we can do now but I mean like you said I mean you could have someone in Lithuania looking at what you put out last night it's a global marketplace. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't even really found my way as far as like, I'm okay at informational content. I'm not really great at like funny content or other stuff. Like I'm still sort of uh, finding my way uh, in that regards. Um, I've done some cooking videos because of people like Alton Brown. Oh yeah, I've seen that. YouTube channel. Yeah. So it's just trying to find out what people are interested in and just give them stuff to build uh, trust. 
build rapport, build fan base. Um, you know, just going in, for instance, and uh, TikTok at one point, I would go in and find an interesting video, go into the comments section and write insightful content or comments related to what they were discussing. There was a couple of comments I made for weeks. I was still getting notifications from TikTok because people were commenting on my comment for weeks. Oh, really? Okay. That never happens on Instagram, never yeah. happens on YouTube. Those platforms are older, they're more saturated, TikTok is fresh, and TikTok is allowing more organic reach. When I post a video, it's not uncommon, I would do it at the time of size jam. I would check it in two days and it had 2,500 views. Because the platform just showed it to more people because of the way they were interacting with it and based on their algorithms being different than the other social media platforms. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Twitter, Twitter is just like a big dinner party. Uh, Twitter allows direct access to Trent Reznor. It allows mm -hmm. direct access to Idris Elba or anybody else. If you were looking for people in Minnesota where you are locally, like other businesses to network with possibly. Um, I also tend to multi-platform people. If I find somebody who's interesting, I'll follow them on other platforms to see how they're doing. Yeah. Or see how they're using the platforms differently. Okay. Yeah. Now I want to go play with TikTok and be up for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, oh, it, it, you could, you could burn some time on it, but if you just understand enough about how to use it, um, some of the TikTokers, like I follow, uh, oh, what's her name? Um, is it Page Master 2000? There's this lovely Asian woman and she does all of her TikToks like in her bathroom window or no, <laughs> her bathroom mirror. But it's absolutely hilarious because she's Asian and she's holding like a rice cooker or a jar of kimchi. Oh, my goodness. Pe Pegmaster 2000. And her TikToks are hilarious about her life. And you're like, every time you're like, w what's the kimchi for? <laughs> but it's, just, it's just something funny and like out of place. Like, why is an Asian girl in her bathroom making a TikTok holding a rice cooker? Like, this is, it's completely funny content, but it's just interesting little shticks about I mean, comedians, I think the best comics at this point are on TikTok. The stuff that I see, these people do sketch comedy that's a minute long. It is hilarious. I mean, there's a guy I follow, and it's all historical skits, like, you know, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And it's like, make, he's acting out characters from like Lincoln and, you know, Stephen Douglas and this, all this historical nuance in a minute long TikTok video in 2020. Like, I, it's, it's, I don't see that content on, on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. It just a, just Unless a it's different, shared from TikTok. Yeah, just a different platform. And the other thing is this technology itself continues to spiral. It continues to mm -hmm. change, get smaller, more compact, easier to use. It's more about where do I think it's going in the future. When I'm multi-platforming and trying to understand how people are using it, it gives me a little bit more insight into the sorts of videos to produce. And just because I can produce informational content doesn't mean it's interesting to people. It doesn't mean that it's noteworthy to people. You mm -hmm. um, being an attractive woman and having Metallica songs and Master of Puppets playing <laughs> in a massage video is something nobody's ever seen. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that makes more sense. Yeah. Could, well, could now I... everyone's going to do it because you just told them all. Oh, well, no. But here's the thing. This podcast has probably been two hours. Here's the deal. One of the things I like about doing the longer podcast has been a debate. The first hour is just to get warmed up. The yeah. second hour is for the fans. Nobody's going to get to the end. They're like, they're busy. They got stuff to do. They're busy. Well, I mean, it's like the vault. There's 500 hours there. The whole plan was to give people so much they can't consume it all, but you find out who the real fans are. When they come Oh, in, is that? Yeah. <laughs> There's me trying to get through all of it. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, if you, if you listen to Metallica, have you listened to Metallica's like entire catalog? Yes. And then do you have like a favorite ear and album? I'm dying. Oh, of what's, what's the album? Um, so I actually love S and M. Oh, okay. You like the later ears. When they, yeah, I, I actually loved when they went and they did, um, with the, with the orchestra. I know it's all like their own songs from like different, but like, that's probably my favorite. And I heard that they were actually going to do it again. Yeah. Um, but who knows now? I mean, allegedly they're not going to be doing concerts 
as of right now, they're saying that they're predicting concerts to come back in the fall of 2021. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, uh, Twitch, what do you know about Twitch? Um, so I know that a lot of bands are using that right now to either play themselves or to relive concerts that they've already done. Yep. One of the things I've, I've talked to, because I deal with digital distribution in like a weird industry as a massage therapist, um, I've talked to musicians and musicians come in two camps. They're like, oh, you can't sell albums anymore. It's like, oh, people just want to download it for free. And then I get people who are streaming a live concert in their pajamas every Friday night, getting donations on Twitch. And I'm like, dude, what do you think the Rolling Stones would have done in 1965 if they could have streamed from their house? Mm -hmm. Like, this is the power that we have right now. And that's the thing about, you know, even somebody like Metallica. So I listen to um, a lot of jam band stuff like Fish and the Grateful Dead. And then mm -hmm. both of those bands have like stuff right now where I think on Tuesday night, Fish does like dinner and a movie. So they just live stream an entire pre-recorded concert from years ago. It's just like a thank you, but like the thing is, they can't tour yeah. right now. And you're sort of drawn into that story. Like people are dying for tour to open up again so they can go see their favorite band. But building connection with people online, building rapport with people, allowing them to see the behind the scenes. You know, the funny thing where, you know, Lars is I mean, playing tennis or making a painting. <laughs> Being able to connect with people that way is extremely powerful when it comes to a brand and also like building personality into your marketing so that they yeah. know who you are, that they, they connect with the fact that you listen to certain music or the things that you're into specifically. Um, I had a, a podcast last night with a young lady and she was kind of concerned because her daughter was like, mom, what's going on? You know? And like her daughter came over and got up in the camera and whatever. And she was like, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, nah. like, like don't hide the fact that you're a mom. Your social media yeah. will put your kids on display in a sense of like, these are the people who drive me crazy. <laughs> but people connect with that. It builds yeah. personal brand around you. I just think because you're a music fan, I would definitely take a look at TikTok and just Go in, look up your favorite Metallica or Trent Reznor songs, Nine Inch Nails, and click on the music itself and see what videos people have made to those songs. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So uh, before we head out, uh, I think we give people your website and your social media shares so they can follow you. Yeah. So my website is starfireinc.com. I like trash the room. <laughs> what happens when you're when you're metal? You trash things. Um, that was funny because I was watching one of your YouTube videos and you were saying um, you were talking about how like you learned the game from rap and you're like, "What's the last time you saw some violence at a rock show?" And I was like, "Have you been to a metal show? Because there's a lot of blood and broken limbs, and I've seen people get carried out on stretchers." Yeah. So. Um, so yes, it's starfireinc.com. It's S-T-A-R-F-Y-R-E-I-N-C.com. Um, at Starfire Inc. on Instagram. Um, I think I'll also add Starfire Inc. on Facebook um, and Twitter. I think they're all the same handle. Cool. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We'll talk to you again soon. And thank you to the people who support the podcast here. I'm going to continue doing this, especially during the quarantine, just to keep myself busy. I appreciate all of the information, feedback that you give me. And if you want more information about me, you can always go to my website, robertgardnerwellness.com. We've got a whole selection of workbooks, DVDs, and a subscription service that's completely free for your first month. There's 500 hours of my classes and instructional materials. If you're looking for that right now and you're bored, it's a perfect time to dig through it. But thank you for tuning into the podcast, and I'll talk to you guys soon.